much for coming out to, uh, to this community conversation about urban renewal. Um, I chair the Redevelopment Authority. I have the honor of doing that with my fellow board members, James Patrick O'Donoghue. You guys just stand up so people know who you are and thank you. Lives are grievous and I've been so very So, um, a Redevelopment Authority's job, we're an independent public body, our job is to plan uh, for the revitalization for the city and to help the city implement those plans if we can. Um, so one thing we noticed when we all started on the Redevelopment Authority is that we didn't have a plan. So that seemed to be a good place to start. Um, we started by raising some money and we also didn't have any help. So the first thing we did is we hired a consultant, Maggie Secret Church, who I'm gonna embarrass right now. I don't usually do this. I think you all know her. Um, but what you may not realize, we're so lucky to have a consultant of this caliber uh, working for us today. I happen to know that at today, at 10 o'clock, she was meeting with former Governor Deval Patrick, and at 12 o'clock, she was meeting with the current governor. <laughs> and today, tonight, she's with us. So she's a, a very high-level consultant. Who do you like better? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like us, 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 us. Oh, okay. Okay. Fair She's a Lawrence <laughs> resident, as we all know. Um, and Maggie helped us all hire um, a great planning consulting group, the Cecil Group, Emily Keys, and this is usually easy to see with the red hair, is here with us tonight. Um, and they are also stars. Uh, they've worked in places like Somerville and Lowell and Salem on urban renewal plans. And we're lucky to have um, folks of this caliber with us as well. Um, but what we're here tonight is actually, we are not doing the new plan tonight. We are starting that planning process on November 18th, very soon. We want everybody to get involved. Um, but tonight what we're here is we're, to, we're here to listen about what happened in the past with urban renewal. Um, and uh, I think we all know why we're doing that. There's a heavy history with urban renewal in County Lawrence and in other places. And we want to make sure that we don't uh, repeat the mistakes of the past. We want to make sure that we know the lessons learned from the folks that have, were part of it, and we're lucky enough, we're so lucky, in fact, to have the very people who would help you with that sort of thing, which would be historians. <laughs> so we are here um, today, jointly with the Lawrence History Center, um, to have this community conversation. So I'm gonna hand my mic to Susan, my partner in crime. Um, Thank you, Kristen. Uh, on behalf of the Lawrence History Center Board, some of whom are here, if you could just raise your hand and identify yourself. Um, I am delighted. My name is Susan Grafke. I'm delighted to be here and be part of this conversation. Delighted when Maggie reached out to us to co-host this event. Um, the History Center, as many of you know, is located at 6 Essex Street, at the corner of Union and, and Essex in downtown. We were founded in 1978 and for the last 37 years have continued to grow our archival collections. Um, and we continue to work with residents and local researchers and receive research questions from all over the world. Just last week we had a gentleman from Australia who came in um, doing research on uh, the sale of wool from Australia to Lawrence when the textile industry was booming. So the story of Lawrence is powerful and it's of interest to people all over this world. So um, we really, it's a privilege for us to be custodians of all that information. This evening is, is for us a lead up to a symposium that we're hosting in May of 2016 on the topic of urban renewal. It came out of strategic planning that we had started three years ago. We identified collections that were um, not only larger collections, but also ones that were most relevant to the, to the current community. And so we identified, this is actually the third symposium we'll have done since 2012. The first was on bread and roses, and the second was on uh, new immigration into Lawrence, and so now urban renewal. And just serendipitously, we found out after we had developed our call for papers for, for the symposium next May that the LRA was in fact embarking on a new urban renewal uh, process. So um, sort of unlikely partners maybe, but I think it, it works and I think that we both, um, we hopefully the History Center uh, can inform the process and, and the scholarship and, and um, conversations like this can help inform their process and, and help the community learn ways to to be a part, to have a voice, and to be part of the, the planning of, of what happens in their city. 
So uh, as I said, the call for papers for our symposium is out. The deadline for proposals is December 4th. And we're welcoming papers, panels, artwork, short videos, and photo essays on, um, on the topic and from, from all types of or either organizations, individuals, scholars, practitioners, researchers, students, middle, high schoolers, on up to postdoctorate, doctoral work. We have several uh, PhD dissertations done on the topic of urban renewal and more specifically. So we're really expecting a, a broad array of, of submissions and so for, to make up a very rich uh, full day uh, program on May 7, 2016. So this, this meeting, I think, is the first of one of the opportunities for the community to, to hear, be heard and have a conversation. We also, um, through the symposium, is another opportunity, but we invite you to come to the History Center, and um, if you want to explore our collections, the Urban Renewal Collection has uh, been developed, uh, a finding aid for the collection has been developed, but we also have mayoral collections from uh, Buckley, Kylie, and Lefebvre that all have relevant records to what happened starting in the 1950s forward. So, uh, we invite you to come in and, and talk with us. And you can ask me questions. My cards are out on the table uh, out front. And you can also ask my co-chair, uh, Professor Bob Horn, who you were about to hear from. So I think that's the best segue of all uh, to introduce uh, Professor Robert Foran. He, uh, he told me earlier his crowning achievement was being on the board of directors of the Lawrence History Center. <laughs> and. Um, he uh, also is on, on another local board, Notre Dame Christo Ray High School, right here in Lawrence. He is a history professor at UMass Lowell. He's researched and written extensively about that about the topic of urban renewal in Lowell, and he's also um, teaching a seminar for the Honors College at UMass Lowell on urban renewal in Lowell and on Lawrence. And those students will. Uh, will engage in original research and produce papers for presentation at our symposium in May. So Bob is generous enough to provide a little context for us this evening on the history of urban renewal. Thank you. Generous means I'm working on three. I'm going to try to do it without the mic because I have a lot, I thought about a lot of stuff to say and I realized I was given precisely 10 minutes and the only way to do that would be to write it down and sort of read it um, and that would make me, and so I've read it three times this afternoon and each time it took around 10 minutes and 12 seconds. So if somebody wants to time me, um, go ahead and if I'm coming close to 10, this doesn't count yet, if I'm coming close to 10, <laughs> somebody wait, that's what, none of this is in my notes. Uh, this does count. So that's count. Oh, then I'm going to go really fast. Um, so the, the challenge was to, uh, was given to me to try to frame the whole sort of big picture of urban renewal. Um, so I'm going to talk only a little bit about Lawrence at the very end to lead into the panel of people who know that history uh, far better than, than, than certainly I do. So I'm going to give you the bigger picture. So large scale urban renewal projects in the United States uh, begin between the First and Second World Wars. Projects really, though, begin in earnest after World War II, with many focused on tearing housing down and largely to build new housing for returning veterans from the Second World War. And my father benefited from that. I grew up in Beverly, Mass. A whole big old part of Beverly was torn down, um, and new housing was built. And lo and behold, when I was three years old, we moved from an apartment to our own little house. Um, and so I'm a product, I guess, of urban renewal in some odd way. Uh, more than 2,000 projects are undertaken across the United States between 1949 and 1973, with roughly 600,000 housing units demolished, um, compelling some 2 million people to move, which is one of the important stories I think about when I think about urban renewal, what happened to all those people. Thousands of small businesses were also forced to close. In New York City, for example, more than 100,000 African Americans were uprooted from their neighborhoods across New York City, <coughs> destroying the social and economic fabric of many of their neighborhoods. Historian Eric Avila has written a lot about the construction of freeways, and urban renewal is connected a lot to freeways. And he wrote a book called The Folklore of the Freeway, Race and Revolt in the Modern City. And he says this about urban renewal. The American city was in crisis after World War II. 
the suburbanization of business retail, and home ownership depleted the urban core of the riches it had hoarded over the past century or so. Against this backdrop, public officials at federal, state, and local levels prescribed massive interventions to remedy what they diagnosed as an urban crisis. They confronted a, a conundrum of their own making. The collective answer of these public figures was usually urban renewal on a massive scale, a process that most often never considered what the residents of those places wanted. The Housing Act of 1949 federal legislation kick-started the sort of urban renewal that reshaped hundreds of cities and impacted a city like Lawrence. The act provided federal funding to cities to cover the costs of acquiring areas of cities that were labeled by the people engaged in these renewal projects as slums. The program's stated goals included eliminating substandard housing, constructing adequate new housing, reducing housing segregation, and revitalizing city economies. Participating local governments received federal subsidies totaling close to $15 billion during this process and were required usually to supply matching funds. Sites were often given over to private developers after the public money cleared an area then the land was given to or sold cheaply to private developers largely to build housing which ended up usually being middle class, upper middle class housing and poor folks that were dislocated, working class people dislocated could not afford to live in the new housing that was built. Um, again, this is a generalization of these processes. The main elements of the 1954 Urban Renewal Act, including providing federal financing for clearance programs associated with urban renewal projects in American cities, increasing the money for the Federal Housing Administration's mortgage insurance, um, and as well extending federal money to build more than 800,000 public housing units. The earliest projects generally focused on neighborhood clearance and were implemented by local public housing authorities, which were responsible for clearing the space and for building the new supposedly affordable housing. In 1954, the urban renewal land taking process was challenged and it made its way all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court upheld uh, the land taking. In 1956, the Federal Highway Act was passed by Congress. The Federal Highway Act gave state and federal governments even more authority to take land. Uh, and they basically gave state and federal government virtually complete authority to map out the construction of highways as part of this grid uh, highway system that was built uh, largely for defense purposes um, at, in, the, in the midst of the Cold War. The multi-lane roads very often were routed directly through borders by these highways. All of a sudden everybody realized, oh, we, go to, we have to now go and renew that space. We have to tear all that down and make it friendly for industry or whatever. And so they created, in effect, uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the focus of the highway programs was largely to bring traffic in and out of cities like Lawrence as expeditiously, expeditiously as possible. Nine out of every ten dollars <laughs> spent came from the federal government to build these roads. And it's part that it contributes to the decline of not just Lawrence's downtown, but lots of other downtowns uh, across the country. All of this taken together, the knockdown of neighborhoods, highway construction through the heart of numerous older industrial cities, and the shrinking of urban shopping areas as malls sprawled along the new highways resulted in a serious degradation of the tax base of many cities and meant that existing commercial districts were bypassed by the majority of car-bound commuters. In Boston, one of the country's oldest cities, almost a third of the old city was demolished, including its historic West End to make way for a new highway, low and moderate income high rises, which eventually became luxury housing. If you're familiar with Storo Drive, you go by and you can see those apartments on your right that say if you lived here, you'd be home now. Um, that's, that's all part of this uh, process. And as well, the monstrosity uh, known as the government center. Um, probably one of the most horrific, horrible urban renewal projects ever designed. Um, Sites, again, were often acquired through eminent domain, the right of the government to take over privately owned real estate for public purposes in exchange for what was called just compensation. After the land was cleared, local governments often sold it to private real estate developers at below market prices. Developers, however, had no incentives to supply housing for the poor. In return for the subsidies and tax abatements, they built commercial projects and housing designed for middle and upper middle class families. Funds were also used to construct civic centers, office buildings, <coughs> stadiums, and hotels on the cleared land. The original legislation had stipulated 
that for each new unit of housing built, at least one old unit of housing was to be torn down. Yet only less than 1% of all the federal expenditures for urban renewal focused on how to relocate families impacted by the renewal process. So families were told, get out. Get out, basically, right? One, so think about that. Less than 1% of all the money spent from the federal government was used to try to help families relocate or in the areas that were going to be um, torn down. Some of the policies around urban renewal began to change a bit with President Lyndon Johnson and the War on Poverty, and in 1968, Housing and Urban Development, HUD and the New Communities Act guaranteed financing for private developers to plan and develop new communities. Subsequently, the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974 established community development block grant programs, which focused on redevelopment of existing neighborhoods and properties. Uh, there was, um, to be sure, a reaction to the urban renewal process. We'll hear more about that, I'm sure, in the conversation later, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But suffice it to say that in Boston, San Francisco, uh, Lowell, Lawrence, other places where these projects are going full bore, people begin to say, hey, wait a minute, uh, there's something wrong with this process. And so in Boston, uh, major efforts were underway to try to stop the Southeast Expressway. In Lowell, if you're familiar at all with the crazy route, the crazy road that's called the Connector, oh, that God, comes off of Route dangerous. 3 that just ends in front of a bunch of houses, the Connector was supposed to go right through that neighborhood out the other side of the river. Um, and neighborhood groups uh, agitated to stop that from going through the neighborhood, and it did, but they had already built that much of it up to where it was, and so that's why, if you're ever wondering, how come this road just like ends and that crazy house right there gets hit every other week? Um, so, uh, in their analysis of the top of uh, what I think of as top-down urban redevelopment, uh, David Diaz and Rodolfo Torres. Uh, have written a book called Latino Urbanism, The Politics of Planning Policy and Redevelopment. And when they look at this history that I've just been sketching out, they say this. Redevelopment has never achieved its legislative mandate. It has failed to increase the affordable housing supply, reverse structural decline in minority business districts, empower communities through direct control over land policy, and employment discrimination, or significantly, significantly increase employment opportunities. All right, I want to switch very quickly to Lawrence for a couple minutes, and I'm just about out. Uh, so in large, large tracts of downtown land, you, you, again, most a lot of you in the room know this story even better than me for sure, because you lived through it. In large, large tracts of downtown land were, were taken, buildings were raised, replaced with parking lots, three-story parking garage, and the infamous in-town mall, uh, intended to compete with newly constructed suburban malls. At the same time, the historic theater row Along Broadway was knocked down, the city's main post office, uh, Federalist style building at the corner of Broadway in Essex was bulldozed down. Most of those structures being replaced with one story steel frame buildings, changing the character uh, of a lot of the buildings in the city. Um, the difference between then and now, which I, I, this is where I want to end in terms of thinking about where is the city then and now in terms of thinking about this process. Lawrence, for me, when I think about the city, is in a completely different place than it was in the, set, in the 60s, 70s, and, and 80s. And I'll give you a few reasons why I say that. Between 1950 and 1980, the city's population fell from about 81,000 to 63,000. Wow. Today, the city's growing. Since 1980, population has climbed to nearly 80,000 people. So it's a more, so on the basis just of people, it's a more vibrant, more active place. Jobs-wise, the city's employment growth, the uh, city has employment growth in several sectors, including health care, services, transportation, and finance. And overall, employment has been on a steady, steady climb since 2010. There, are, there were approximately 1,200 business establishments in the city of Lawrence in 2001. Today, there are just over 2,000. Wow. And private investment is up as well. There is also a vigorous effort to vitalize the city's green spaces, mill spaces like the one we're in, being transformed into living, working, uh, working, and exciting working and living spaces. So today, the general objective, as I think about it and assess the larger history, should be how do we think about crafting a process for revitalization whereby city officials, policymakers, advocates, business owners, and residents 
figure out a way to work together to produce what I would like to hope we can get to, which is equitable development. Uh, this was not the guiding principle 40 years ago. Rock the mic. My work here is done. Uh, you know, when you when you start a story with uh, World War II and you keep it to 10 minutes, that's that's pretty, pretty good. good. <laughs> I know quite a number of people I would wish I could give that skill set to. <laughs> um, again, my name is Evan Silverio. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm a lifetime Laurentian. Uh, went to Central Catholic, St. Mary's, uh, local business owner, property owner, and a member of the LRA. So uh, I would think I, I'm, I'm extremely invested in the, in the city of Lawrence, just as everybody here is tonight. I'd like to introduce our panelists tonight, uh, starting with uh, Armand, Attorney Armand Hyatt of Hyatt Hyatt Law Office. Uh, Attorney Hyatt was raised in Lawrence. He still has his practice in Lawrence and has been here since 1976. Extensive experience in affordable housing and uh, housing development and has remained as pro bono to general counsel for the Lawrence community. <coughs> so, Attorney Hyatt, thank you again for uh, attending. Carrie uh, <laughs> Poirier, did I pronounce that right, Poirier? Thank you. Um, Associates uh, Professor of History at Merrimack College. <coughs> she received her PhD in 1978 from the American and New England <coughs> Studies program from Boston University. She served as uh, first program director of the Immigrant City Archives, now known as Lawrence History Center. Uh, and she also worked as preservation planner for Lawrence Community Development for five years. Yeah? OK. So that right. We're going to dive right into it. We're going to go right into the questions for the panelists. Uh, I'd ask, you know, Maybe keep your answers to between five to ten minutes, uh, just to save some time here. Uh, beginning with Armin, what role did you play in the previous urban uh, <clears throat> What role did I play? Well, uh, I was I, I was just somebody who started off being pretty upset over the fact that the neighborhood that I grew up in as a kid was being had been raised while I was off at school. When I came back and realized that, you know, uh, where I played as a kid, the buildings that my grandfather had built the building, my grandfather came over from Italy, <coughs> on the other side, that building was, was uh, level, and the whole neighborhood was level. The whole Italian, uh, the, the Napolitan section of the Italians, that whole neighborhood was, was level. And uh, so, um, and, and I already knew that, uh, you know, that, that as, as uh, Bob mentioned, the gorgeous uh, post office building that was at the corner of Broadway and Essex. And uh, there was a beautiful building at the corner of uh, Lawrence and Havel Street. Um, that uh, the public library is now, that was a beautiful building. It was surrounded by a gorgeous brick wall, one section of which is still there. You can look at it, it's got like a little cap on it. It's very good. Anyway, so the theater row, as Bob mentioned, it just so, so many things started happening, and I started getting you know, aggravated. Meanwhile, Isabel Melendez, a friend of mine, um, was uh, telling me about the fact that there was um, uh, that a lot of people who lived there were uh, were currently living there were pretty upset that they were being dispossessed. I got to meet a gentleman who's here tonight by the name of Len Raymond, who really had an incredible amount of knowledge about what was going on at that time, and um, as a result, uh, you know, um, he, and he was working with Isabel in a, in a company called. Uh, it was starting a group called Immigrant City Community Housing Corporation to try to fight and reclaim that section of, of the Italian <coughs> neighborhood that was leveled uh, because it, the city was in the process of trying to amend the urban renewal plan to expunge, get rid of any affordable housing component. And Len has a very great sense of justice and. He knew what he was doing. I was fresh. I was kind of, you know, I had been practicing law for a few years, but I was doing consumer cases and things like that. I was doing various different things that lawyers do, but I didn't really know anything about this stuff. And, you know, uh, Len had a lot of knowledge. He had been working for the planning department for the city of Lawrence. And um, 
so we, uh, I, I started listening to the man, and, and of course with Isabel, whom I trusted, you know, uh, implicitly, and uh, we were we, we together with some other uh, folks, Father uh, Robert Cassetto from St. Mary's Parish, and a few others. Uh, Modesto Maldonado was a, was a member of that uh, immigrant city group. Um, we were um, uh, we basically fought and had to resist what the LRA at the time was doing. The LRA was essentially trying to take care of and serve the requirements of the, of the merchants, the holdover merchants on Essex Street, who were really, really pissed off that the Methuen Mall had taken away their business. And they would, they did not want to see you know, Essex Street go, and they blamed it on everything. They, they, they basically blamed it on, you know, the, 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 uh, the they blamed it on, I'll tell you, they blamed it, I'll use, can I use their word? They blamed it on the space. That's how they, that's what they called it. That's what they called it. So excuse me, but I'm, I'm really letting you know what we were up against, okay? I'm getting right down to it. That's what they, that, that's what they blamed it on. And so we knew that that, that's, you know, that wasn't right. And so, and really Len, uh, you know, had guided us a, a lot through the process. And uh, we ended up teaming up with the CDC out of Boston, uh, who called it the time Greater Boston Community Development Corporation. Tell me if I'm, give me one, tell me when I have one minute left, all right? You're, you're right so, you're so we teamed up with the, we teamed up with the CDC in Boston and uh, uh, Greater Boston Community Development Corporation, which is now called the Community Builders, and we teamed up with them to help us develop and fight what the city did. The city, and there's a headline for this, and I intend to uh, find it and bring it to the symposium that uh, the History Center is doing, but the, there's a headline that says, Mayor, city, mayor, city council score victory as uh, low income housing banned on North Common. <laughs> that was the headline. They amended the urban renewal plan at the city council meeting to ban, to expunge, get rid of the low income uh, component of the plan, which was the whole reason for it in the first place. I'm really about the funding. But they eliminated that component, and they went forward, and they and they held, they did an RFP process, and they gave the, the, the they awarded the developer the development to a, a for-profit developer, and we um, battled that, and we challenged it. Uh, Len was again a guy who knew all the strategy. I'm not you know just trying to. Uh, cast all the shine, all the light on it, but really. You might still generous, please. No, 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 no. <laughs> the point was we had a group of people. No, I know that. I, exactly. <laughs> but you hooked us up with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Justice in Boston, and as a result, we put together, we worked hard. Isabel was helping to uh, uh, get the affidavits that we needed from residents who were displaced, so that they were aggrieved parties, because you have to have aggrieved parties to have a lawsuit. So we put together a lawsuit uh, in federal court that was that thick. And we presented it to the city and said, this gets filed next week if you don't reverse the process that you just, but, and I started getting phone calls from the other developer trying to get bought out and saying, look, we'll, we'll back away. Just give us this amount of money, you know, and it's like, give you what? <laughs> you know, you, you get nothing, you know. Um, so, we, you know, it was a fight for us, but um, uh, they, they realized that the fight was more than they wanted and they did back away. They did revamp the process. They did rebid it and they make sure that uh, low, the low income uh, component was going to be part of the process. Um, there was something at the time called the Lawrence Strategy, which was headed by somebody who ended up in federal prison for stealing money from all his office. Anyway, that's... Um, so who that's on me? Name? Yeah, well, I, well, I'm not going to name him unless somebody asks. <laughs> but because uh, it's a matter of history, it's a matter of fact. Um, anyway, that fight was a fight that, 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 that we fought and, and eventually we decided, um, and again, you know, we decided that, yeah, that we should form our own CDC. So as a result of, because we realized how helpful it was to be teaming up with um, what is now the community builders, um, and uh, at the time, Greater Boston Community Development Corp. So we decided we should form a CDC, and we did in 1986. That's your one minute. One minute. So in 1986, <laughs> we, we were uh, going forward. We, we managed the Heritage Common, the Heritage Common, um, excuse me, um, uh, cooperative units that you see, the residential, 140 of them. Those were developed by our group, and um, towards the end of that, we did form uh, a community development corporation, which is now called Lawrence Community Works. At the time, it was called Heritage Commons CDC, and uh, it's um, it's grown. And a lot of a lot of great things have happened over the years. But that's my involvement with urban renewal.
as uh, they ask the question. <laughs> <laughs>
that was all supposed to happen. The textile museum that was then located in North Andover was instrumental in stopping those projects. But the irony of, of it all, the frustration, I should say, with the urban renewal was it was a federal program, and it only allowed expenditures for certain activities. And historic preservation was not one of the activities uh, originally uh, included. Today, urban movement has changed. I don't, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun talking you about that. You haven't. Or a I that. Okay, with the. No, no, no. You can go ahead. It's okay. Okay. Because, um, you know, so there are differences between urban renewal back then and urban renewal now. You have a much greater latitude in, in the activities uh, that can be undertaken. It's a state program rather than a federal program. And they're bringing many more tools uh, to, to the project of economic and urban development. We might get in there, but um, <laughs> I mean, it's very easy to see why we have this panelist here, especially after you know just that one question um, and their uh, their knowledge that they have on the topic. Um, Robert talked a little bit about it. Uh, but now we want to hear from Armin and Carrie about uh, what is different or the same about what is happening in Lawrence today versus back then. I think there's more of a, 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 a um, spirit of teamwork alive now and, and much less of an us versus them kind of uh, attitude. I think that's huge because I think uh, you know, planning and, and everything derives from that. I think, you know, whether if you're kind of in a, you know, huddled in a corner feeling like, okay, we have to watch out for that, for that group, from that group, I think that you begin to have isolationist kind of ideas and, and there's, there's less of an opportunity for, you know, common good. That old saying, you know, rising tide floats all boats. I think people in Lawrence are now really, you know, embracing that concept. I don't think that was that was kind of prevalent back then. Um, so that's one thing that I've noticed. I'm not sure about the oversight aspect. One of the things that happened during the year of the plan is that the demolition contractors that demolished all of those houses, those I, I, you know, there were triple deckers. I mine, mine was about 11 units, 11 units above Nancy Electric Corporation, and uh, and. Uh, uh, that all that stuff got demolished, and we Len was able. Len told me that his in, in looking at the, the documents, he was determined that what the demolition contractors were paid for was to remove all the foundation oil tanks and rubble from all of those uh, uh, buildings that they demolished. Guess what we found out when we developed the housing? <laughs> all the foundations were still in the ground. They just buried it all over. So somebody walked away with a lot of money. I hope that that couldn't happen today. So I hope that's another thing. Now, Karen, you, you, you were mentioning it a little bit. I did, John. Yeah, yeah, but that's all right. Um, is there anything you want to add to that? The only thing I'd add is that I think there is, um, and of course my thing, my shtick, is preservation. Um, and I, I do think there are more instruments to, uh, to guard against the abuses of demolition and th that put in place uh, an appreciation of the intrinsic value of, of good quality historic structures and um, there, there's involvement of the community. Um, I, and, I, and I hope that will continue the event of historical commission, places like that won't, won't be in, uh, in, won't act to inhibit <coughs> what's going on but we be one more of the assets and tools of the community that are And you also have an institution like the Lawrence History Center. You have a lot more institutional appreciation of the value of the city than I think existed in the desperation of the, the 70s, 60s and 70s with that whole economic base of the city. There are more opportunities to Well, it sounds like um, 
we're repeating the same thing of you know community involvement, and I think that that's the importance of tonight's meeting and getting this started, um, making sure that everybody is aware, uh, so that the mistakes of the past don't continue to happen. Um, good segue into it. Based on uh, your experiences, what advice might you have for the urban renewal planning of Barnes going on today, going on forward? Listen to the people. <laughs> Stems from that, really. You know, that's first and foremost. I think. I think it was before it was it was the whisperings behind closed doors what guided the decision making, what guided the, the planning, and I think that's that can't happen again. Was there uh, was the same communication that's happening today happening back then? No. Not even close. No. They would just do it and not really tell anybody. Yeah. That's right. So that's what I'm saying. It was just the thing the plans were, you know, announced it was happening. Sometimes you'd have to, yeah, you'd find out when something was already up there. Well, it was always a better complete about the plan to find out what was going on. So. so we're starting off on a good note here. <laughs> uh, Carrie, you want to add to that? Um, any experience? <clears throat> when I was thinking about this ahead of time, the, the one thing that struck me, and it plays off what you were saying, Armin, is that there is a, a need to understand the community and to avoid a pitfall in planning. Uh, planning from aerial, <laughs> the aerial perspective, looking at aerial views, looking at statistics, looking at maps, um, and then imposing a plan on this abstract vision of where things should go. And I really need to think that what planners need to do and this is not an original idea. Louis Monk <laughs> said that you have to walk the community. You have to talk to people. You have to, you know, one of the, the walks I would encourage planners right now to do is to take the walk along the canal. Start at the gatehouse at, by the dam and not just drive there, park the car, get back in the car and then go off to the spillway, you know, where everything rejoins the Merrimack River. You feel that whole one and a quarter miles. It's not that long a walk. One and a quarter miles along there. You feel the, the whole history of the city, the, the water power, the way that water plays into the city. That would be one of the walks. And the other walk that would be a series of walks that they would make and go into communities. Walk the, in the neighborhoods, um, see what's going on in those neighborhoods, actually talk to people as they walk along, go into businesses, not just Essex Street, go into neighborhood businesses and talk to people and learn the pulse, the blood pressure, everything of the city uh, by them walking. And I think if I could just add the, fact, the idea that they were. 1,100, 1,200 businesses a few years ago, now there are over 2,000. Says something about people's investment in the city and the fact that the population in the, in the city has grown tremendously percentage-wise, the city's grown quicker than the state. Um, that those are pluses which indicate that people, that, that the population that's coming in and investing and whatnot is here. And so again, I feel like that's a different place than where a lot of the conversation was years back. People were trying to figure out how to make money on an exit strategy, bury all the stuff in the foundation and get out of town, and whoever it was that ended up in jail, right? I mean, let's figure out how to do this and be a retreat where we make money in the process. But it wasn't necessarily thinking long-term and or in what everybody else was just saying in terms of being engaged in the community. But the fact that the community is growing places the discussion to me, thinking about the history in a completely different light than it would have, you know, if you're trying to do this again 35 or 40 years ago. It's really a very different, uh, a very different historical moment for the city. And that's, so that, I mean, I think that's great. I mean, if you're not, it's not, people aren't trying to figure this out from 
being in a hole and trying to dig their way out. People have already, that, that's already going on and that's already clearly happening in every piece of data that I've looked at about the city suggests, you know, that's just going to continue. Every economic indicator, probably what I put out there is gone, but I put an article out there that I had written a couple of years ago um, on the city economy after that horrible piece came out in Boston Magazine or whatever the hell it was about City of the Dam. I said, that's not what I know about Lawrence. And so I did research and then wrote this piece called City of Possibilities and looked at it completely the other way. And that's how I know who those numbers people are. So that, that's like a, I mean, that's a momentous occasion to be then thinking about, okay, where do we, where do we go with all this energy and investment and, and, <coughs> and love of city? I think that's a way better place to be in than people were 35 or 40 years ago when Arlington's Hope and College in his neighborhood was gone. I mean, that's, that's not a way to grow a city. So it's, it's safe to say that um, we've heard a lot of horror stories uh, tonight about the urban renewal plan, but the same people who are talking about the horror stories are also talking about it's a necessity today to move forward, which is pretty interesting um, because of the dynamics, how the dynamics have changed within Lawrence. And we think that we've made uh, the, the next steps in order to move into the new urban renewal plan. Um, again, you know, being conscious of what happened in the past. So that's extremely interesting. Um, we're going to dive right into Q&A. Uh, a couple of <coughs> obvious uh, ground rules. Uh, be respectful of others' ideas and opinions. Okay. Um, please limit questions and comments to once or two minutes. I'll do the same thing. You know, stop the pad here. You know, everybody should uh, uh, should kind of come to that conclusion. Uh, and then, last question of Porter Rose. I'll let you guys know. Uh, but any questions for the panelists? Um, I think right now is an exciting time. And I think uh, maybe some people are stirring up. Yeah? Hi. Um, my name is Mary Ann Caslow. I'm born and raised in the city. All four of my grandparents came over from the old country, met here, got married here. And my parents couldn't speak English until they went to school. Okay? My roots are all here. When I was in high school, it was in the 60s. I graduated from the high school in 65. At that time, there was one public high school, one Catholic boys high school, and seven Catholic girls high schools. Wow. Okay? They were all ethnic. All right? And, then, and it was during the time Buckley was the mayor, and we got this thing called urban redevelopment. And the thing that broke my heart was all these beautiful buildings were just torn down and not given any consideration to the people and the ethnic groups and everything else that was involved. And they put up these new modern buildings that are just garbage, all right? Many of those buildings have been replaced. The Frost School had to be replaced. The King School had to be replaced. All these other buildings had to be replaced, okay? And I remember Essex Street is a thriving business. My mother worked there, and, I, and the stores were wonderful and everything else. Okay, everyone got along. Polish, Irish, French, Italian, everybody, okay? This is the immigrant city, and we need to keep it recognized as the immigrant city. Yes, there are many new nationalities in here. I would love to see an international thing where some kind of a cultural thing where we can recognize all the ethnic groups. I would like to see if this is the plan, the urban redevelopment plan, Lawrence is only seven square miles and half of the city is not represented. There's a lot of areas here that should be in here and that, that aren't recognized here that should be, okay? In South Lawrence, doesn't get any recognition at all. And there are areas in South Lawrence. I want to see the park that's at the corner of Winthrop Ave and South Union Street fixed. I want to see something done with the South Lawrence Library and have better use with that. There's buildings around that we could do so much more. And that's some of the things I would like to see. Great. Anybody want to comment on that? 
If not, we'll go into the next question. Yeah? I would comment by saying, number one, I love the passion. Because that's really, that's, that's what starts it. If you care that much, mm -hmm. that's what counts the most. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not sure about, you know, like this particular urban renewal plan that's currently being worked on and, and devised, I, I guess it has boundaries and that's the way they have to go, I guess. But that doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's exclusion of other places from what okay. I understand. Just the, this, the particular focus. Maybe somebody from the LRA can comment okay. on that. I'm a, I, I think I'm, the a past, the I'm a past vice president and trustee of the Mount Vernon Neighborhood Association. I've been with it since it started and everything else. We've worked hard to keep the Mount Vernon area nice. Um, I was talking to someone today about like the businesses on South Broadway. We would like to see how the lights were on Broadway after the Malden Mills fire, like we'd like to see that extended through Broadway and have that made as a nice thoroughfare all the way through on Route 28. And it, you know, I'd like to see like a, a business association because we have different neighborhood associations that are working. I'd like to see the businesses do that too. Uh, just to make a quick comment, uh, no boundaries have been set yet. Nothing is set in stone. There's the plan is at its earliest stages. Okay. Um, so there, there has been, <laughs> but November, actually I'll, I'll get into, uh, well, might as well get into it now. So get into it. November 18th will be the first official meeting of uh, the urban renewal planning mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. I encourage everybody to go. I'll give you the information at the end as well. Okay, just to continue on with the Q&A, uh, any other questions, comments? Our panelists are here. This is a great opportunity for everyone. No, do we need the mic? Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the examples of urban renewal where the process has really allowed for business sectors. A lot of the other steady areas that we're looking at is a lot of commercial districts. Um, how has urban renewal helped out or uh, uh, facilitated the process of economic development and, 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 and economic vitality? Or is it just off negative? Are you asking historically or presently? Yeah. I, guess, I guess if you have context of both, that would be great. And historically, I can, I'm safe with it. <laughs> Back 30 years, I'm good. Um, this, this, historically, it hurt because historically, what happened was highways got built and connector roads between highways, highways got built, all of which essentially allowed people to bypass the sort of normal driving down, say, here Broadway or Lowell Merrimack Street or whatever. And you can think of other, if you grew up someplace else, you can think of the same thing where a highway, I grew up again in Beverly and Route 128 cut the city in half and it really did a number on the downtown commercial area and then they built a big mall out on Route 128 and everybody sort of <coughs> headed that way when they went to shop. They didn't think anymore about going into the downtown and so all of that was done largely with cars in mind and with the idea of moving people quickly and everybody fell in love with free parking and a big, you know, gigantic place where you could put your car. And so now I think that it's trickier to try to figure out, well, how do you, how do you begin to bring back downtown um, in that fight against malls and whatnot? And so, I mean, I, I, I think it's doable and I've seen places where it is, but it's really, really um, difficult and there have to be some anchors that will sort of create population, right? I mean, Lowell's been struggling with this, with this for years, um, trying to get people living in old mill spaces and assuming then that commercial will grow around those mill spaces. And it's kind of working, but not really. Um, so it's tricky. I just, I wanted to say for anyone who didn't have a chance to see on the way in, that the urban renewal planning team that's working with the LRA um, from the Cecil Group has produced plans that really do address job growth, among other things, and economic development. Um, they're here to listen and to hear from all of you, but also to share the work they've done in other communities, many of them with similar characteristics to Lawrence. So again, Emily, if you could raise your hand, and Kevin, where are you? 
Um, so we, after we break, we've got some time for you to go look at the plans they've developed, ask them questions, what was the community process, what were the priorities, what were the outcomes, what was, you know, what, what was accomplished through that plan. So we really want everyone to have a chance to see what current urban renewal looks like, which is in many ways very different from what you've heard. But, you know, it still has the same name and it has some characteristics in common, which is why it's important to be thinking about the lessons from the past. So we do have a great opportunity with the Cecil Group on board to learn from what, you know, Salem, Somerville, Bedford, many other communities have done with urban rule to advance um, some of their own objectives. So I just wanted to make sure we have that opportunity for people to interact with them. Um, so my name is Joshua Alba, I'm a former resident of uh, <coughs> Lawrence. Um, and I do a lot of reading on um, the feelings of capitalism, the declining global economy, uh, how a lot of um, cities around the world, countries around the world, community groups around the world are really trying to innovate um, away from business as usual, um, away from just merely creating jobs, away from the business as usual, right? I'm going to a whole entire uh, Does the current urban uh, renewal models involve sustainability, economic sustainability, social sustainability, where we're not just contributing to a failed fabric that we're trying to bring. bring the resources up from the people that are already here, creating spaces like I, there's this idea of, of uh, like Toronto and Singapore are doing. Um, uh, uh, renovating their large buildings or creating large buildings to have indoor farming, commercial farms, in order to feed their local population and not import, export, all that stuff. Um, and then people are affording their, their produce at pennies on the dollar. Um, and then they're getting skills training with students and just creating a new culture. Is there anything like that to help curb climate change, to help curb predatory capitalists and, and all this, this crazy stuff going on? Like the, I'm really concerned about that. Well, I think Lawrence is a small enough community to really get that going. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that it, it was that was one of our ideas, just brainstorming. But that, right? Yeah. Yeah. We have yeah. some yeah. specific yeah. ideas that you know that, that would be also something that's going on now that other communities are doing. It, and it's one of those why can't we type of things. Yeah, I'd just like to echo what Armin said. I kind of love that the comments or some of the questions are really about the future. Um, while we're listening to this stuff about the past, it's really what we hope would happen is that people get excited and really alert to the fact that there's a planning process that's going to start. And we wouldn't want to and can't do it without it being a community-driven process. And we want really big ideas like yours, and we want the smaller like things that we could do as well, and we want the middle term. We want to really get them all on the side. So the secret to this meeting, if there was a theme here that Urban Renewal used to be like, there's a secret hidden agenda. Like our secret hidden agenda is we want people to get excited about the plan <laughs> and to join and start with these ideas. So please. And I have to jump stay in. Tuned. I have to jump in and say that the difference, this is the chair of the LRA speaking right now. When we used to go into LRA meetings, they wouldn't look up at us. <laughs> there wasn't even the slightest bit of eye contact. It was so icy. There was no opportunity to feel like we could have any input at all. And so the idea that now people who have ideas like, you know, uh, Vernon and you, uh, what you just said, Josh, I mean, I mean, that's exactly, it's just the opposite of what we experienced. So I would say based on that, City of Possibilities, anything's possible. <laughs> I just add something about the link between the past and the present and the future um, and thinking about innovative economic development. I keep thinking about water and renewable energy. And Lawrence is, you know, it's not just the dam and the big hydroelectric plant over there. There, there should be some examination of the viability of renewing some of the turbines or you know, they'd have to be replaced. But the use of water power it, it, underneath the mills that used to be selling to NASA Electric, they used to be selling unused electricity. <coughs> the use of solar power in the city, how many acres of flat roofs are there for solar collectors in this city? Uh, there, there were all, this city was designed to produce energy 
That, that was it, its reason. <laughs> and there are still opportunities in that area. I don't know what is viable, what isn't economically, but it seems like a perfect place. Okay, right. it, was, it was actually a battle over that one the game was winning. It was the wrong side of the prison mm -hmm. to do that. But there, was, there was a fight over that issue. Unfortunately, it was well put down in terms of those people who didn't care about such questions as bringing that kind of economic liability to the city by its own ability to produce power. Yeah. But uh, it's, you know, once that, that's all sunk, sunk in terms of cost, raise and maintain over the whole history from that point on. Tremendous to the city. But, um, instead, what we got was an, uh, what I would call an eco pornography. <laughs> <laughs> that what was, if people remember, they used to have a Lawrence Dan on TV all the time talking about how wonderful the power company is because essentially, look at this project, we're supporting this. And it was, it was a nonsensical project that was built. It didn't contribute to the city of Lawrence. And all I did was provide the, uh, the electric company with the ability to say, I'm the good people. because this is kind of like one of the few times that the LRA has come out publicly to hold these kinds of meetings, which is great, because now you're, you're being more inclusive um, than in the past, as, as Arnold has said. Um, one of the challenges that we face in the city is that we don't really have a downtown. I mean, we think we do, but we really don't. Uh, downtown consists of Essex Street and Broadway, where you have a lot of the businesses that is a mixed um, use of the, of, the, of the area because of the, um, of the types of businesses that are there. So, but it's not really a downtown because it's, it's not a destination where people will be coming to after 5 o'clock at night. And one of the reasons for that, especially on Essex Street, is the fact that you have so many service providers. They're not really, um, they're not really your uh, little stores or retail stores where that is going to attract people. So in, in this whole planning process, I think the LRA in talking with people should be looking at how can we best relocate some of the, the service providers that are on, on the first floor on Essex Street and have them moved up to the second and third floor of a lot of these empty buildings that we have and create more retail space on the bottom floors. I mean, that, that would be a good use of, and you, you're not moving them, we're not moving them out of town, we're just putting them up that people will go because they're there from nine to five and then leaving the retail uh, for the people. The second aspect of this is we need to bring back a cert, uh, to downtown, a certain government agency that brings people to the city. Because one of the, the, the problems with the city was when all of the offices, the governmental offices moved out of the city, then that took all of the foot traffic from downtown Lawrence back in the 80s and, and 90s. Uh, so these are some of the, uh, the things that can start, that the LRA can start looking at without having to make some major changes and that could probably benefit all of us. And the other thing, like Ar Armin said previously, this was all done secretly and it wasn't, um, there wasn't really participation of, of the community. Now, there is an opportunity to make it more inclusive and have a lot more people participate and be part of this process. Good. Um, we have time for maybe two or three more questions.
more questions. I want to just mention again that none of this, I mean, all, all we're taking account of all this. We have Kevin and Emily here from the CISO group who's working on the urban renewal plan, and they've just been, uh, it looks like their fingers are bleeding from all the notes they're taking. <laughs> so this is, we're, we're taking all of this extremely seriously. Um, Emily is great. She wants to hear all the ideas that you guys have, and now's your opportunity. Uh, so maybe uh, another question, comment, or two. Oh, okay, here we go right here. Thank you. Um, I tend to uh, question the of uh, using the downtown industrial areas for residential use. Uh, it seems almost suicidal. Uh, there are no schools, there are no parks, there are kids are going to be playing in the river. You know, I, can, I can see kids falling through the ice in the wintertime. Uh, That's a disaster, potentially. I don't know the merit of that at all. I can, we're not doing it again, I understand, on uh, on Union Street. We tried it on Merrimack Street. It seems to have been a failure there for whatever reason. Now they're coming back with it again on, over here on Union Street. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, <coughs> I can't really comment on that. I'm, I'm just a moderator. But <laughs> <laughs> I know that there's extensive studies currently being done to analyze all of that to see what the best use is. Um, I think that uh, Sal has done a nice job at the other end of Merrimack Street. Of, you know, I think that that concept should be encouraged. But uh, geez, if a residential is such a power thing. I don't know. I think people have, people have lived in cities, though. I, my experience is that not, not everybody is going to have a suburban feel. It was pointed out that Lawrence is less than seven square miles of development in real estate. So I think it's 6.2 miles of development, something like that. And that's a reality. That's not going to change. So there's not going to be an opportunity for uh, you know, pasture land in, in your backyard. And some people throughout this world live in cities. And, and there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that, especially with the design you know, uh, of, of, the, um, of the reuse of the mill spaces. Uh, uh, the mill buildings are done in ways to generate healthy living which I know we started with at Union Crossing, we do have solar panels on the roof. We also have a lot of, a lot of other aspects um, uh, that are, uh, Maggie can actually speak to that more precisely than I, but we're looking to try to overcome that sense that it's, it doesn't belong there, because it really can belong there if it's more of an urban feel for living. And so that's, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but I just say like, well, well the moments, if you, it, those buildings are there, there is such there is such a thing as urban population and, and you know an urban style living. So I think it, it fits in that category. That's how I feel. I don't know. I respectfully disagree. That's okay. So the young lady. Hi. Um, I'm actually a resident of Union Crossing. I live in Union Crossing. I live in Union Crossing. I'm actually a resident of Union Crossing. Um, and I just want to first thing I want to say is thank you for coming. I know it's been a long day. I know you guys have had a long day. And I really appreciate you coming and doing this for the community. So it gives us a chance to collaborate as a community to talk about our views, ideas, and everything. I, hey, Mayor Rivera is in the back. He's everywhere. Say hi to the mayor. Okay. And also, and if, I'm all for solo paneling, solar. But unfortunately, where I live, I have a horrible management company that will, even if we give them suggestions, they won't budge. Unfortunately, I live in a condo, and our management company is terrible. No es bueno malo. So it would take a headache to even get anything done where I live. But if more people who live in homes do solar panel and solar, that would be very good and more important to help the environment and it would be very important. So if you guys can, who are able to get do it, please do it will help the environment and less congestion in the area and stuff. So thank you, gracias. Go on, Lisa. <laughs>
Has there been talks about a uh, talking about best use of different buildings that are vacant or or stuff? Um, I have some ideas of I have an idea of how to use maybe one of the buildings. Sort of start a nonprofit incubator, like a bunch of nonprofits could go into one building and share space and share resources. Let me tell you or no, you're part of you're starting a nonprofit. Because I'm probably the second ever nonprofit and that would help me out. I <laughs> might have a lot of space, but I now that I ended up talking about the whole general They community. ask for good works. Come on. No, no, generally speaking, that maybe use of building uh, in the future, like in a nonprofit incubator, a bunch of nonprofits can use one big building and share office space and resources. I think that's that's another great suggestion, and I think that that's also something that Emily's taking down now, and also something that we've thrown around in the meeting. So thank you again. You're welcome. Really have to wrap up, so if it's a good quick one, well, I'll be very quick. Uh, although Ahmed has certainly uh, sparked suppliers in me in terms of the history of <laughs> irrespective, that's, not, that's for another point. The point I was going to make is that I used to, uh, in the 70s, one of the tasks I did for the old planning department was to run hearings around the city. We were, we were trying to look at the old term maximum citizen participation, but it really didn't work. So the real challenge, I've got applied with the LRA is doing very, very much. But the real challenge is how are you going to best do this process of actually getting maximum participation from the citizen, citizens and the people in the neighborhood. It's not an easy task. So I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of like throwing that out there and say, look, okay, please pay attention to that, guys, because it's really important to do. And it's not easy to do. How are you going to do it? That's where I think the us versus them problem. You know, the fact that that's gone away a little bit, I think, might help. Thank you again. And I think that that's something that we've talked extensively about, and that's definitely one of the most integral parts of the plan. So thank you again. Um, at this time, um, I'd like to introduce a personal friend of mine, uh, Mayor Danny Rivera. Kids from the city using a tool 
to take control of what really is developmental chaos. Things are getting torn down and built in places maybe they shouldn't be. People are sitting on important pieces of property that can unlock whole neighborhoods. Um, and they're doing this with no, with un, any, any pushback. We have two things that happened in, um, since I've been mayor uh, with the receivership program and um, it, it, it was a place where people would get properties and sit on them and build up they own on them and then they'd sell them back. If you're familiar with the receivership program, it, that was in chaos. To the point where there's a house next to a, a, a liquor store and the liquor store is in desperate need of parking. And, the, and they're gonna tear the house down so they can have parking. That's horrible. It's a, it's a one family, it's over, it's over on um, railroad, off of Railroad Street and uh, I wanna say mar margin and uh, Margin and Hayford? Where is it? Second? Morgan. 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 But we had left, the city had been so irresponsible in managing their development process. If they're going to tear down this perfectly fine house, by the way, we know it's perfectly fine because we've been in it. We've got, if they want to tear it down because they think that the parking for the liquor store is more important. And that the judge won't terrible. make us, the judge won't make us a pre existing, that the city will, def, will not let it be torn down. They won't let us put that in the uh, for the uh, advertising. So it is the wild west as far as development is concerned. And I'm looking at my phone because I have notes, sorry. Um, we know that we have historic stewardship too. Um, I, I think that our efforts to redevelop the stone mill and help uh, Mary and Haley in that effort is clear. Um, that we want to make sure we have the, our treasures, our artifacts continue to stay there. Um, I think there's been ample examples on how to do that in Salem and Lowell. So it's not like something like that won't happen. That it won't happen. Um, so I, I think about this process not so much as a process of, of how to. Uh, how do we change what's here, but how, how do we keep what's here and help people that are here grow? Well? Um, people like, well, you can take in one of those built office uh, mill buildings and just make it double A office space. It's really cheap, you can probably do that. Right? But the people that are gonna go to work in it don't live in Lawrence. If it's gonna be high end, high to skill labor. We're in a middle community, we're gonna have a lot of people in this community always, who will always have this. And the many community people coming into it the lowest level of American dream and walking through it. And so if we want to keep that, I think that's a big character. We have to have the defensive mechanisms to do that. And this plan will allow us to be defensive against bad development. And I'm so thrilled that we have such smart people on the LRA and thoughtful people working on this project because I have no idea how to do this. <laughs> and, they, and, and us as a community, we don't have any idea how to do it. I mean, Mark and the, and the housing committee, you know, we end up giving properties to people because they come before us. The only reason why we do stuff is because it's on the agenda. And we don't ever build a gender bar on, I think this is a possibility. And ours, I don't ever talk about me or I, I think it's ours. Mm -hmm. um, I have a college side degree, I don't have any idea. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for the time and being thoughtful. And, um, I'm around here.
Uh, Councilor Plant, thank you for stopping by. Uh, we ask everyone and encourage everyone to get involved. Uh, please check out the current urban renewal plan and talk with the urban renewal team from the season crew. Uh, to have a more in-depth conversation on urban renewal from the past is going to be that great uh, symposium in the spring of 2016 the Lawrence History Center. We have some information in the front for that. Uh, for the urban renewal plan that's going on now to get more information and get more involved uh, with what's going on, uh, we have the information up front for that. The next meeting is November 18th from 7 to 9. Uh, please make it. As you can see, we're really trying to get community involvement, get everybody's ideas. Uh, please don't stay silent. This is a big, big event that could be coming up. Thank you again, and have a great night.